The one thing I've learned is I will take me with me for the rest of my life in every interaction and in all business scenarios. And if I'm not buying back my time in, and then obviously like delegating and replacing, but then investing it in things that are going to allow me to produce more, then that's, that's going to be the bottleneck of my ability to grow. Like no business grows past the growth of the, the owner. So the question is this, how do most agents find the secrets to succeed in today's competitive real estate market, especially when the top agents are keeping those secrets to themselves? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. Hi, I'm Aaron Amuchastegui, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars. Hey, this is Aaron Amuchastegui, and you guys are in for a treat today. As most of you listeners know, you guys know since May, I've only done four or five interviews myself because of what's going on you know, with my daughter and my travels and, and some different things like that. But when this uh, application came through for somebody to interview, I was super excited. So today I'm interviewing Dan Martell. So Dan Martell is not a real estate agent. He's not a real estate broker. You know, I know Dan as the founder of SaaS Academy as an expert in everything related, you know, software as a service, recurring revenue businesses, online marketing, all sorts of stuff uh, like that. But Dan is also, um, you know, he's bought and sold some companies. I think so we're going to talk about that. And he's a new author. So I'm most excited about his book that he's releasing right now. And I'm going to let him Tell us a little bit about it. So, so Dan, welcome to the show. Tell me about uh, what's the name of your book and expand on your bio because I know it's yeah. much more dramatic than what I just gave you. Well, Aaron, I appreciate it. A few things. One, uh, my brother's in real estate. He's been uh, real estate. He, he's a home builder. So like I grew up in this world. Uh, he represents a lot of his own builds. He works with real estate agents. Um, I think we know each other through the real estate software world. So I actually coach some of like, I think I have about 40 companies that serve real estate investors, real estate agents. Um, dozens of my friends own real estate brokerages. And uh, I know the world really well. So I'm really excited to be chatting uh, with you. And uh, yeah, my journey is is kind of crazy. I, I grew up really challenging uh, upbringing. I actually ended up in jail as a teenager. And um, through that process, uh, I went to rehab and it was in rehab I learned to write code and it literally saved my life. You know, learning to write code became my new addiction and then personal development, kind of the ultimate or, or business, the ultimate personal development program. And um, since then, 17, I've built and sold uh, three software companies, um, two were venture backed out of Silicon Valley. I've invested in 50 plus companies as an angel investor. I was named one of the top angel investors in Canada. Um, you know, I live down in the Valley. I, um, mentor and support a lot of software entrepreneurs. And five years ago, I started SAS Academy. It's now the largest coaching company, uh, for software entrepreneurs. We have about a thousand clients and, um, you know, the process of coaching these clients was how I came up. Well, I, the process, the, the buyback principle, uh, the core of the book is something I've been teaching for a decade, but it's, it's kind of something as I started working with clients, helping them scale their companies was the, the theme that was kind of like, we all, you have to start with this and then we can actually build the business part of it. So that's where buyback your time came from. And the core premise of it, just to give you guys the, the teaser, is you don't hire people to grow your business. You hire people to buy back time out of your calendar. Because if not, you'll hit the pain line. Yeah. And, and he's talking about starting without foundation. I had forgotten the part about your bio of... Um, I mean, I went to prison for a couple of years when I was 20. And that was, was kind of like my reset as well. Um, where it was like realizing I'd lost some good amount of time of like my prime years and, and decided when I come back at this, I better, like I had to make up for lost time. And it became some of the, some of the drive where I found my, my new hobbies, including real estate. And, uh, and so just fascinating as that compares now. And you're also like in your spare time, you do all sorts of stuff. So if, if, if you, any of you guys follow Dan on social media, you're doing all the fun stuff like wake, wake surfing and hiking. Um, you've yeah, done uh, you do triathlons. Yeah. 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 I did a couple of Ironmans this year. Downhill mountain biking, uh, backcountry snowboarding, heli snowboarding. I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, it sounds like you and I share the same kind of like um, zest for trying to squeeze as much out of our lives as possible. And I think, you know, both of our experiences probably was the, 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 the driver for that. So like, yeah, today my life is I do one of two things is I either work with incredible people in my companies or I spend time with friends and family doing stuff that really 
fuels my soul. Yeah. You know, a kind of a, a topic about, so you, you coach a lot of real estate software companies, right? There's a lot of guys, the, that's how I, f- I first met you through SAS Academy for, for one of our brands. And then, you know, so many of, of my close friends are still inside that. And right now, one of the things I think that compares to real estate before we jump into your book is you talked about like really, really finding our avatar, really, really finding our person that we need to target. And I remember, you know, early on in some of that process going, well, we serve these people and we serve these people and we serve these people and we serve these people. And, and everybody on your team would point us back to like, no, you're supposed to focus on one sort of avatar. So how do you think that relates to like real estate agents in, in their world? And especially like right now, as real estate's going to be more difficult over this yeah. next year or two, instead of, you know, houses selling every seven days, you know, in seven days, they're going to take 45, 60 days. There's going to be a third as many selling, you know, how, how, how does that compare? What advice do you give to real estate agents when it comes to that before we go into? Yeah. Buying I, I mean, it's, it's like everything in life, you know, um, generalists make money, but specialists get paid, right. And the riches are in the niches and, and it doesn't matter you know, and we've all seen the market soften, interest rates go up and, you know, inventories are starting to, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff out there. And, you know, I have one of my friends, we talk about this all the time. He's a real estate agent, Richard. And like, he's, he's doubled down on his, his niche, right? Cause he knows that like, I'd rather be known as the guy that sells this kind of property and the go-to person so that when people are like looking, they, I get referred than just being the everything person and then just sounding like everybody else. And I mean, that's in business, you know, it's a, it's a lot easier if you choose a customer and and most people don't want to do this because they have this sense of like, what if I pick wrong or what if the market isn't big enough to support that? And I always say like, just, just pick one. It's like a bowling pin strategy. So you pick the first pin and then you go all in on that. And what happens is it allows you to build a marketing that's aligned, your deliveries aligned, your, your fulfillments aligned. Um, and then once you've kind of built compression in serving that customer, you meaning you get the referrals, you're known as that person, you can kind of look at the close cousins of that initial focus. And that's why the bowling pin analogy really works. It's like, Hey, we have the first pin. We're, we're known as this. Okay. What's the close cousins to that? Let's, you know, instead of just doing, you know, um, certain types of homes, maybe we go like, you know, one level up or down around that so that, you know, we brought in our total market size or, or even our geography. And that, that is how every business has actually ever been built from all the technology companies that people know about, like Facebook, you know, it started in universities and they slow rolled it out to, um, all the great companies that we're, we're fans of from the Nikes to the big brands. They all started by focusing on a core customer and through that process expanded once they had traction and resources. But, the hard part is if you try to do too many things right out of the gate, you're just going to be nothing to everybody and you won't have the the pull of the market to make money to actually reinvest in growth. And that's that's the sad part when I see customers say, well, we serve these three customers. And I'm like, pick one. Let's get to a million in revenue on one. You know, as long as the market's there and for most part they are, you're, you're, you're pulling from other people or you're deciding to be world class at something, but it's a winning recipe. It's just for a lot of early entrepreneurial people, it's just a scary proposition. Yeah. I think for, I think for agents listening and, and this, and the small business owners and stuff, you know, I think that applies to both your avatar, like your target, like who do you serve the most, but also your strategy, right? So we're talking about like some people, and we've talked about recently on the podcast a lot, like maybe you're, maybe you're door knocking, maybe you're calling distressed sellers, maybe you're calling, you know, but it's focusing all in. And sometimes people say, well, I can't build a whole business off of that. But if you become world class at that, Dan's bowling pill, bowling pin analogy, it's kind of like if you just focus on distressed sellers, but you do a lot of work with those distressed sellers, so much of real estate, any of our experts that have been agents for 10 years, they say they're getting all their deals now just from referrals. Like all, it's like this badge of honor where they get to say, well, no, now it's totally referrals. Well, that's because they mastered something in that bowling pin analogy. And then those people start telling their other friends. So the distressed seller that you focused on might be telling the friend that has a million dollar, a $10 million property that you were that best agent. And so I think the bowling pin analogy really helps people be brave enough to focus on an avatar or a strategy knowing it doesn't mean they're only going to do that. But if they no. get world class at that, it, it'll, it, it's it'll just focus. I, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I learned this from the founder of lead pages. You know, they went from like zero to 400 K a month in revenue in like six months. 
And he, he shared with me, I remember I, I built this platform called Clarity and it was um, a marketplace for entrepreneurs to give advice over the phone. And he reached out to me for fundraising advice. And, but I was like, how did you grow so quick? Like, how did you go from zero to 400 K in six months? And he, and he shared with me this philosophy that I called the scaling credo, right? And it's the scaling credo is, is kind of like the, these five ones, right? Like one pick one market, one, like you were saying, like one avatar. Then we focus on one, um, you know, channel, like what strategy we're going to go, you know, uh, the distress uh, sellers, right? Like what strategy we're going to pick. And then we have one sales tool, like what's your conversion tool. Some people try to do a bunch of different like webinars and phone calls and, you know, they hire a salesperson, they have partners. So I I just say pick one sales uh, tool and then one follow-up formula. And the fifth one is the most important is do it for one year because the person that goes deep, they're, they're going to win. They're they, like, so people, again, they worry, what if I pick the wrong uh, marketing channel, right? I'm like, it doesn't matter because your focus on that channel is going to create the reps and the, the awareness and, and the nuance, right? Like just copy, like design, volume, skill set, phone calls, infrastructure, software around that one thing that's going to allow you to compete against other people that could be doing it as well, but they're just doing one of four or five things is, is just that discipline is what literally I wish we could go to the early days of all these companies that we all admire. And you literally see that same pattern repeated. Hey, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Buchastegui, and I'm interrupting myself to bring you this commercial break from one of our sponsors. There's somebody I've been looking at for a long time, and when they reached out to me, I said, yes, we have to be able to do this deal. So that sponsor is Follow Up Boss. There's a lot of superstars out there that use Follow Up Boss. What's your favorite CRM? We're using Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. I love Follow Up Boss. I love it. We have action plans now for bringing on new agents. We have action plans for our recruiting. Uh, we call them action plans and follow-up boss, which will trigger tasks for the agents to do as far as calling. Follow-up boss, I like more for the integrations with everything, MailChimp, call action, all those different products. I will say we used Sync and we switched from Sync to follow-up boss. Honestly, the greatest CRM I've ever used, I've used Brivity, Sync. I've looked at Boomtown, like Real Geeks, just a bunch of different ones. But me personally, I fell in love with Fub about like seven months ago when I first started using it. I've used Boomtown, I've used Line Desk, I've used Conversion, and I think Follow Up Boss gives you the most integrations mm-hmm. that are simple, and it gives you the best ability to go and integrate large things into one single solitary platform, yet at the same time, it's still affordable. I do like Follow Up Boss better just because it you can text from the app and things like that. It's just a little more convenient for me. Um, it tracks everything that I need. I can customize it if I want. If I want to go smart list based, that's fine. If I want to go task based, it's fine. I think it's one of the best systems and it's very user friendly. It just really helps me never drop a ball because it's so user friendly. I don't have a one horse in the race with Follow Up Boss. Purely objective. Follow Up Boss has been the best one that we've found. Now I've used Follow Up Boss. We've actually used it in our non real estate businesses as well because it's so good at being able to set timers, set automatic texting and emailing. So here's what we got. For Real Estate Rockstars listeners, you get a 30 day free trial. That's normally 14 days. So in order to get this, you go followupboss.com, just like it sounds, forward slash rockstars. Go there, get your 30 day free trial and check it out. Especially if you aren't using any systems or any CRMs yet, this will be a great one for you to start with. Thanks again. Now back to our show. Yeah, I got to do it for a year. Like, like, as you one as you year did your step, of focus, just commit. Yeah. I mean, it's so like the, we hear so many of the stories of, you know, when I, when I first quit my job to start d- doing the house flips, it was, I mean, I, I had, I had like two months of savings and I, I remember, and I didn't do it for a year. But the, but I almost quit too early because we were up to like 60 days in. I remember telling my wife, like, Hey, I haven't, I haven't bought this house yet. There was the foreclosure moratorium. There's all this stuff way back in 09. And I said, you know what? I don't have any money left. I'm going to have to go ask for my job back or ask for another job back if I don't get a house this week. And then the next week I got the first house and then we were off to the races. And I think that like it, it was so close to my life being a forever W2. Um, after 60 days, like that after was 60 the, days. Yeah. I was within a week. I was within yeah. a week of like, okay, that plan didn't work. And I love 
And there's probably a lot of people just starting their businesses like that. So just going like, yes, be ready for a year. Be ready to do this thing for a year and dive in because you don't want to quit before that miracle happens and, and you, you find that niche. You know, we've been talking a lot right now. So a real estate agents over the last couple of years, so many of them had like giant revenue, mortgage brokers, agents, so many different people. They're building up these big teams. And now, and I think during the time you just mentioned, you want to hire people to get your time back and not to like build up the business. And as people are growing, it's really common to like put somebody in this place and put somebody in this place is, Oh, we need somebody just to take those calls and somebody to work these leads. And now that it's slowed back down, people are going to have a chance to look at their team and say, is this the team that I want? Are there some people that we need to adjust as people are thinking about that? Like who to hire, why to hire, you know, I'd love it if you could go into that, like buy your time back, why to hire people, how you choose through that process, because I think it applies for both people growing their teams right now. And then also for like fine tuning the teams they have. And then I, I mean, I'm faced with it right now where I was for like two years, two or three years, man, I was barely working like an hour a week traveling the world with my family, like three weeks a month, we're doing this early 2021. I see some big opportunity. I'm like, I'm going to jump all in again. And I'm going to start just working around the clock to grow these businesses. And the last two years were incredible on that side. But then I just went to Croatia with a bunch of buddies and there were several of them that weren't having to take any phone calls, any work calls. And I was sitting there being so jealous. Like, how did I go back into this? Like, you know, 60 or 70 hour a week mentality as I was growing. So cool. Now I had a good couple of years, but now it's time to totally go back to the opposite and get my life back. So, so dig into all that stuff. Like, like what's the premise of the book? What's the process? What advice can you give people in those hiring processes? It's, it's you know, Aaron, I love that you set it up this way. Cause it's, it's essentially what you just said, right? I, the, the subtitle of the book is get unstuck, reclaim your freedom and build your empire. Cause I actually want to teach these processes is it's, it's, Sil- it's Silicon Valley. Like I learned this stuff by some of the smartest tech companies um, in the world, moving down to San Francisco and being in it. And so a few things. One is mathematically speaking, your, your time is worth something. I call it the value creation score. Okay. On an annualized basis, you produce value. That's your score. Okay. Well, if that's true, and this is true for everybody. And, and, and th- then there's this thing called the buyback rate. Right. And if we don't learn this, then as we grow, it becomes painful because we'll do things like take on a bunch of projects, hire a bunch of people. And all of a sudden we wake up and it's like we hit this pain line. Right. The pain line is the more I grow at this point, it hurts. Right. My calendar explodes. Mm -hmm. It's like if I actually tripled your business next month. Would, would your life start to suck more? And for a lot of entrepreneurs, it would. So what do they do? They either sabotage where they're slow to respond to opportunities. They don't make key hires. So they sabotage their business because growing is painful. They either decide to stall. What if, what if I just, what if I just stop? You know, I had a friend, Matt asked me that once he was an electrician, he owned an electrical company and he goes, you know, is it okay if I don't want to grow? And I go, I totally get it, but here's the deal the market isn't going to demand is going to not going to stop demanding more. Your team is not going to stop asking for more and the world is going to keep growing. So do you want to slowly decline or do you want to like just decide how to solve the problem? Cause it wasn't growing was the problem was the way he was growing. And the third one is deciding to sell or stop, you know? And I think the real estate space, because it was so easy to get into because a lot of people succeeded really well for the last two years, really three, four years, there's a lot of people that are at this point going like, oh, now I have to work. And I don't mm-hmm. like, this is going to be hard. And maybe I got into something that I really didn't want to do it for the right reason. So to me, like, I want to help entrepreneurs get past the pain line because I really think like great creators, entrepreneurs, like we need more of them. So the whole philosophy is the buyback rate. And the buyback rate is what can you afford to pay somebody to buy back your time? right? And the math is simple. If you just look at your, your income and that could be what you pay yourself profit, you know, above whatever things that you put in your business, I call these seller discretionary expenses, like, like things that shouldn't be there, but are there. And you just take that amount. That's essentially, you know, how much value you create on an annualized basis. If you divide it by 2000, okay, I'm going to ask people to do some math. I apologize, but we divide it by 2000. That's, that's the hourly value of your time. But I always want people to get a 4x ROI on uh, like outtasking or buying back your time. So you divide it by four again, right? So if you're, if you're a half million a year earner, like income, that's, that's $62 and 50 cents, right? If you do the math, that's what it works out to. You can pretty much 
buy back your time on all levels of real estate for $62.50, right? Like from coordination person. And like, I know this industry a little bit, you know, definitely an executive assistant. I still see like my, yeah. you know, some of my best friends still don't have somebody that's coordinating inbox and calendar. We can talk about the replacement ladder, but, um, and, and then if, if it's only a hundred grand a year, it's $12 and 50 cents. Right. But we live in this world where there's a lot of ways to get leverage. You know, one of the things I learned from a guy named Naval Ravikant, one of the smartest, you know, Silicon Valley investors, philosophers, and just like a mentor of mine. He taught me, he goes, look, at the end of the day, and this is why this principle is, is a first principle on growing. You only have four levers for, or four ways to get leverage, right? Time goes in, effort gets put, and then an output is created. This is all entrepreneurs, all CEOs, doesn't matter who you are. The four ways to get leverage is three or four C's, and people should write these down. The number one, first one is collaboration, right? Collaborating with other people, partners, employees. So, you know, like the collaboration side, it's labor. Second is capital, right? It's why, you know, a lot of businesses and individuals raise money to grow their business faster is you get capital. So you put effort and capital, you get leverage. The third is code, which is, you know, how, like automation. A lot of the clients that I work with in SaaS Academy that are in the real estate space, like using technology to get leverage. And then the fourth is content, you know, producing content like we're doing today. We, one piece of content might take an hour to produce, but it can go on to serve 10,000, 100,000 people at no additional cost. So pretty much that's the equation. And the buyback rate will let people know where, what, what they can afford to, 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 to buy back. And then the question is, what should they buy back? So, so even if you have a whole big team, Aaron, like if, if people are listening, they're like, well, I have a team of eight or I've got a team of four. Like, do I keep them all? What should I do? I always go back to our calendar and I go back to energy, right? So there's this thing called the time and energy audit. And essentially what we do, and this is what I do with my clients is every 15 minutes, I ask them to log what they're working on for two weeks. And it sounds daunting, but it's actually not. Most people can actually use their calendar if they put stuff in their calendar to get a good close approximation. But, you know, people also don't honor their calendar. So it's not always accurate. But if you just take your journal, like I got a journal here and I just log every 15 minutes, I got a timer and I write down what I worked on. Then at the end of the two weeks, what you do, and this is what I do with my executives as well. So I, I run two eight figure companies, like when they're stuck, when they're overwhelmed, we're, we're going through the same process. And we'll go through the, the task and I'll say, okay, take a green marker and a red marker and highlight everything in green that lights you up, that gives you energy and everything in red that takes energy from you. And, and over time, things that used to give you energy can suck your energy, right? Like yeah. I used to like to do this. Now I don't like to do this. That's fine. doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong. Just highlight them. Then what you do is you go through that same list and you put a dollar sign next to it. And I use, I use $4 signs, $1 sign for things that are like $15 tasks and $4 signs if it's like $100 type of stuff, right? And we just go through that same process for the same task. And what you quickly start to see is things that are red and $1. And all that stuff, you group it together and you got to get it off your plate. And if you actually approached your business that way when we started building team members, instead of being quick to like, bring on uh, another real estate team member. We first started with an executive assistant to increase your capacity. That's actually how mathematically you can't, you can't grow a business faster or more efficient than that mechanism. And it's what the Valley does. Silicon Valley has been doing this for decades because the more you grow, the better your calendar looks. And most people's Achilles heel, the thing that's going to cause them to fail is their decision that it's too painful to keep growing and decide to stop. It's not the market, it's not the opportunity. They can use those as excuses, but it's literally the way they've built their business. Real estate rock stars, this is Aaron Muchastegui. Thank you for letting me interrupt for a second. I've got something really, really important to talk about. You know how last year we kept talking about that mastermind? What is the mastermind? What are we talking about with that mastermind? Last May, there were like 60 or 70 people of you listeners that had never met, flew out to Austin, Texas. We all hung out at this awesome event center and we spent a couple days with some great guest speakers talking about skills and strategies to succeed in real estate. And then we had these mastermind tables where everyone rotated, everyone got to meet everybody, everyone got to provide value. Some of the agents there had only done one or two deals ever. Some of the agents there had done hundreds of deals and they all got to interact and help each other build their business and build their strategies. And I've heard so many stories of friendships that came from that, of referrals that have come from that. There were six or seven people at that one that heard me talk about doing an Ironman and we all did an Ironman together in, in North Carolina 
last month and we had never even met before the podcast live so the it was it's, it's been such such a cool experience the i would love it for you guys to come today is march 6 through 8 the sign ups right now go to hybendigital.com forward slash mastermind we also have a room block set up it's three days downtown austin great really cool hotel really cool uh, convention center that we're going to be hosting it and we're going to get a chance to i can't wait to meet you guys i can't wait for you to meet other listeners i can't wait for you to develop these new interactions and really what we're teaching yeah last year it was like how do you make a business better but the market was just starting to turn and i was trying to give some people some advice of what to do when it when it was happening now it has turned and this time we're going to be talking so much about how to pivot and what to do next so uh, again, I hope you signed up for the mastermind. Sorry for such the long advertisement, but I can't wait to meet you. Hybendigital.com forward slash mastermind. Yeah. So the, what a great homework strategy, right? And especially for the people that are feeling stuck. I mean, the exact scenario where it's like, okay, I, I, I've been working, I've been working a lot and, um, and it's like, Hey, and so we, we accomplished this, but now what, and now what to look at. And it, yeah, it does sound daunting to like start writing that, that, that checklist out. But I guess if you're, you know, but a lot of the people out here, they're sitting at, we're sitting at a desk, we're sitting at a computer for a long period of time, working on emails, knocking out projects, different things like that. So you just have that timer go off every 15 minutes, you write it down. And then, yeah, anything that we dread, I mean, I, I know everybody listening right now is picturing one or two things that they do that they would like be highlighting red without even having their journal. And when I have my journal, there's things that stick out as highlighting them as red. And then, and I think so many, much of the time we know like, Hey, I like doing this or Hey, I don't like doing this. Um, you know, a cool thing that a, a friend of mine reminded of me, it reminded me of a couple of weeks ago was it was also that reminder that there's probably somebody that my red is their green, right? Like there, I've got, some, I've got some guys that like, that, that, that really don't like negotiating with contractors. And it's a really important part of like real estate construction is like getting tons of quotes and negotiating with contractors, finding that best price out there. And some people on the team just really don't like doing it. So they will do it and we keep pushing them to do it, but I bet they would highlight that as red. And he reminded me, he was like, you know, there's people out there that love that. There's people out there that would love renegotiating with contractors and would love going and finding a better discount and, and getting to light up that way. And so the, I like that idea of the red and the green part of me even wonders if I, if I had, if I could get my teams to do it, they could probably, well, this trade is the thing. I, I've used this strategy with my executives when they're like overwhelmed and we're doing too much. And I'm like, cool, let's do a time and energy audit. And they're like, okay. And, and most of the time they figure it out on, on their own. Right. Cause you know, and, and you, you mentioned the, the finding people, I, I call it finding people that play at the things you work at. Right. And like Sandy on our team, she's in the finance team. She loves spreadsheets. She loves reconciling, you know, transactions. It is hilarious how much she would like if you took that away from her, she'd probably go into a depression. You couldn't pay me enough money to do that kind of work. Right. But when you yeah. give people these tools, they'll they'll s kind of self-regulate. They'll, they'll get to a place where they'll be like, oh, I thought I was overwhelmed. But you know what? It's like in the book, I talk about like, well, first stop is delete, defer and delegate, which is a time management strategy people have been doing for decades. Right. It's like, what are the things that I just got to stop doing that literally for some reason, like doesn't serve me? What do I need to delegate to a team member? And what I do, I got to defer just to maybe another date, maybe another quarter, like it's not a now thing. And it just starts to cr create space to think, you know, most people are so busy doing, doing, doing that they don't have time to think strategically. And, and when you look at like, the best CEOs and founders out there, that's actually like a big part of their week, you know, 40% of their time is just thinking about working on the business working on the systems. You know, and I'll share because uh, a lot of people I think are going to struggle. Okay, well, now that I know this, what am I supposed to do with this information? Well, you know, there's this thing called the replacement ladder. And um, for me, it's the first thing is just having a strong executive assistant. But people hear this and they're like, oh, I have a virtual assistant, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the difference, right? There's two people. I would, I would literally sell everything I own. If you made me like I would, I would just do everything. I would give it away except for these two people in my life. One of them is my executive assistant. The other one is our house manager. 
Okay. Now it sounds a lot of people have never heard of house managers, but essentially think of it like an executive assistant, your business person. They're, they're like your partner in crime for all things work. And then our house manager, she essentially takes care of all the personal things my wife or I would have to work on so that we can literally do one of two things, work on cool projects or spend time with our friends and family. And because of that, we work through them. And the only way to have an executive assistant actually support you is have them in your inbox and in your calendar. And that's a tough one for people. I'm like literally saying somebody else has to take first pass, all emails that come in, all scheduling, everything has to go through this person because they're creating this context about your life and they're going to be best suited to support people. Now, I'll give people a trick because Aaron, people always get stuck with this because they're like, oh, my client wants me and it's a personal touch and it's a relationship. And I get that. You know, my brother sells houses and he was running into the same issue where he had a team for everything else, but he was still managing his inbox. And I recommended an assistant, hired somebody six months later. I was at a barbecue at his house and I was like, how's it going? He's like, I don't see what the big deal is. And I, and I knew as soon as he said that, that he hadn't delegated his inbox. He was just looping this person in to accomplish things. And I said, well, here's the deal, man, is you, you actually have to walk away from your inbox, like get away from your email and your calendar and work through this person, meet with them daily to review stuff. And, and, and the inbox is the to-do list, right? Like, here's the deal. If you don't have an executive assistant, you actually do have it. It's you, right? You're doing $10 tasks and you don't build million dollar companies on $10 tasks. And you, and you, you can, you can hire people to do the other stuff. It's just like, you're almost like degrading the quality of your life and your time by doing these things. And, you know, an email inbox is nothing more than a public to-do list for other people's goals on your time. It's kind of crazy if you think about it. Like it's literally yeah. a, a list of requests from people just sending you emails and you're stressed now because there's three or 400 unread emails. It's like, I don't even, I have zero stress about my inbox because I have a, a great process and relationship. And, and, and I, I get it, Aaron. Like as soon as I say this stuff, people are like, well, how do you find this person? Look, recruiting is recruiting. You have to be good at recruiting. But I will give people a tip. It's called the, the camcorder method. The way you delegate anything in my life is I record it. And then when I hire the person, they go through the recordings and they set up the process. And the reason I do this is two reasons. One, a lot of people are afraid to hire folks because they think, well, now I got to take a day or two out of my life to train this person. So if I'm just recording myself doing the work, like processing my email, and I'm just talking out loud when I'm doing it, then there's no extra work. It's net time, no extra time. I literally just record the screen. Then the recording's there. I do this three or five times. And then when I hire my executive assistant, I give them the recordings and I say, you create the playbook, right? You document it. So they get, they get the training, they create the playbook. And then the cool part is, is for whatever reason, let's say something happens and they don't work out. Well, in two months, I just hire somebody new and they have the trainings and the playbook. So literally every hire in my companies come in and for two weeks, they're onboarding themselves. They're watching the trainings, they're reading the playbooks. And at the end of those two weeks, we're just having them uh, essentially answer uh, an assessment to see if they read the stuff that they were supposed to, but it doesn't take an executive or a team leader to have to train them because it's all part of the process. And it wasn't like this, oh, let's take a weekend retreat and document all of our systems and playbooks that become stale in two seconds. It's literally just a very fluid process that all my clients use to really scale quickly as a camcorder method. Yeah. What, um, where, do, where do you recommend they store that? Like there's different, like a Google drive. Um, we've been using Tetra for some stuff lately. Yeah, like, do you have cool. a favorite thing out there to build, to, to put, build this like as <laughs> standard operating procedure booklet? I like keeping things simple. So, so if everybody has Google docs, it's free start there, right? I just like my methodologies and tactics are super vanilla Crayola. Like I don't like overcomplicate, even though I'm a tech guy. If you yeah. ask me like, no, we have this, but I want to take it to another level. I'd rec I recommend Trainual. They were a client. I'm, I'm an equity holder in the company, but I've looked at all the different tools and it's what we use. Like Trainual is a solid platform for doing that. And I do think, you know, there's a difference between kind of training and SOPs and, and maybe like the corporate wiki, right? Like a Tetra. So, and, and what I've discovered, it's not really the tool that matters. It's the process. You know, you can have all the cool whiz bang software if you want in the world, but if you don't actually like have your team following a methodology for updating and documenting and, and using it when they're doing the work, then it's not going to stick. 
Yeah. Yeah. We recently, I mean, a couple of years ago, we were stuck in one of our software companies and, you know, the team spent like a month or two trying to figure out which tracking software they wanted to use a Jira or a Monday, all these different like tracking stuff. And you know, we finally picked one after a month or two and they were using it. And, and honestly, that like that next six months, we had like very little, very little progress was made. There's a lot of like ready aim, but no shooting happening. And, um, and then more recently when they started bringing up, you know, the playbooks again and the new growth platforms, you know, and they said, oh, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to re-sign up for Jira and do this. And I just said this, let's just do a really simple Google sheet this time because I, I would much rather we're spent because it's just as simple to go, here's our list and then we can scan the stuff in order, but let's actually just get some stuff done right now. And the, and if it gets to where we can't, it's so convoluted or complicated, we need all that extra. So I think you're right. I think sometimes there it's like the growth patterns, but it is yeah. great whenever there's like advice or a process that has no friction to start with. Right. Simple this is free, scales, complexity easy. fails. Right. And I think people look at software to like solve problems that are process problems that don't require that level of complexity. And that's, that's why like everything I do, there's, there's levels to it. You know, if we're talking about a hundred person company, it's a different answer, but yeah, when, when people are like, Hey, I'm just trying to start, it's like, you just need to learn how to build a playbook, right? You need yeah. to start recording stuff, right? Let's not get, get caught up in the tools. Yeah. Even as a, even as a software guy, I was recently talking to a, a, a guy that, that helps run one of our businesses too. And we were talking about all the different operating systems out there. They talk about for businesses and he goes, you know, my favorite operating s- system is just get stuff done. It's just j- dig in and get some stuff done. And there, cause again, he's like, there's values to EOS and all the other stuff, but sometimes, sometimes that's like step later and not the step right now. So yeah, the right time, right action. About, yeah. <laughs> say that again. Right time, right action. I got, I got this from Eric Reese who wrote the lean startup and it's just this philosophy that like every problem needs to assess around the solution for now, not forever, right? It's the for now, not forever. And, you know, I think like, like you said, it's like, it, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Let's just solve like, what's the minimum effective dose to solve that problem. And then as the problem gets bigger, then we adjust what solution we're using to, to solve. Yeah. You know, the, and everyone out there listening right now, as we're changing some stuff around, it can be so easy to like to do the ready aim, but never shoot or the trying to figure out or you're trying to reinvent the system. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm not open houses aren't giving me leads anymore. Maybe I should do this and building out the system. And again, there's a place for that. But how about the the idea of I mean, give yourself the freedom, just like what Dan said, to solve it for now. Like solve something for now. It doesn't this doesn't have to be the solve forever? The market's going to be pretty different nine months from now than it is today, and it's going to be way different twenty four months from now than it is today. And it would be a shame if you spend three months building up a system that's obsolete in six or nine months. And from my experience in real estate, there's going to be a lot of there's just so much change that will happen over the next thirty six months that the that it's just way better just to get into get into action with some of these. I like your comparison about the executive assistant and the house manager. And I think there's times when I have dreams that the, that one person can do both in that. And I think a lot of people kind of, um, seek that have, have your, have any of your people tried to do it pros and cons with that? Is it, is it just impossible because the person seeing your personal life is going to be different when they see your business life or what do you think? No, I mean, it it could be done if you don't have a high volume, but I think what's unique about my methodology and approach is, is really about not delegating tasks, but delegating outcomes. So when you tell your executive assistant, like you, you own these outcomes, right? You own the, the inbox and this is what greatness looks like in my inbox and you own my calendar and this is what great calendaring looks like and you own project management, right? Cause like a great executive assistant, that's why I use that word and not virtual assistant or just even an ad- admin or, you know, like, they're buying back your time. Like you literally get a clone. Like I get, I get easily a week out of my executive assistant for her focus. And like, she's got a team under her now and my house manager reports her, but it's just because of the volume of stuff, right? When you're managing multiple companies. And and I learned this from Richard Branson. I had the privilege of spending a week with him in 2014 in Switzerland at his house. And I watched how a guy that owns and runs 400 companies through the Virgin group of companies, two CEOs. So there's co-CEOs of that group. 
And he literally was spending the week with us. But what he would do is every morning, he would sit down with his executive assistant, Helen, and they would have breakfast for 60 to 90 minutes. And Helen literally took all the incoming requests on Richard's time, all the people like he didn't do emails or anything. And every morning he would only present to her things that she didn't even know how to handle. So like she had been working with them for at that point, 10 years, right? She's still with them. And she, she like knows how to route requests from like, Oh, this person wants to talk to this person or like most things never even get to his attention. Right. And, and they just sit down to figure out the stuff that's just kind of weird. It's like, well, this person asked for that and he said this and I'm not sure. And it sounds like you might know him. And Richard's like, Oh, yes, I met this guy on a flight and, and please connect him here and here. And that's, that's the conversation. And I think a lot of people, especially in your inbox, they feel like, and I knew I, I struggle with this. I was worried. What if, what if like a friend of mine emailed me and they got a reply from my assistant? Cause it is my e- email, like my emails, all my emails, my personal emails. It's all one spot. And the language that I came up with that everybody should consider is when my assistant uh, replies to people, especially if it's the first time, she'll say this. She'll say, hey, um, you know, hey, Mark, it's Ann Danza, executive assistant. I got to this before he did. And I thought you'd appreciate the quickest response. And then she replies. And that all of a sudden makes it just seem like such an like great place of service, right? Not that I'm too busy and I'm not I'm too cool for my email. But I want to make sure that you get what you need and I'm not the bottleneck. If you just think about the amount of stuff that you um, are slower to respond to, opportunities, um, just even scheduling like a podcast interview. If you email me and you're like, hey, I need a headshot, I need a bio. Well, I, if I'm gone for three days at a retreat or whatever, like I don't want you to wait three days. Like there's so much business you can pull forward in your year. That, that is not even about just your time, you reinvesting that in other stuff. Like just the, I, I would can say it's probably, I'm pulling forward three months of effort and projects and process just by having somebody else continue the rhythm throughout the day while I'm heads down doing the work that only I can do, right? That, that, that creates the most value with my time, right? And I think that's, That's the other thing, right? Is if you do buy back your time, people are like, well, what am I supposed to do with it? Like if I gave most people, if I gave them an extra day, right? I said, okay, like real estate agent, you have an extra day to work. They're like, what am I supposed to do? Like most people are reactive. They're not proactive. So that's where the, you know, I have this framework called the drip quadrant, which is delegate, replace, uh, invest, and then produce. The invest quadrant is all about working on, the mindset, right? So like literally your, your, the, the six inches between your ears, like the way you think about your world is it will have a dramatic impact to your ability to produce income. Then it's skills, right? Like I now need to learn a new skill. I need to learn how to do open houses. I need to learn how to do, you know, uh, outreach to distressed buyer or sellers. I need to whatever. So there's some skill that you probably need to acquire, or it's, it's relationships, right? Investing in people and conversations and your, your, your trading market and all these things to, to, cause these are things that you have to do. Cause the one thing I've learned is I will take me with me for the rest of my life in every interaction and in all business scenarios. And if I'm not buying back my time in, and then obviously like delegating and replacing, but then investing it in things that are going to allow me to produce more then that's, that's going to be the bottleneck of my ability to grow. Like no business grows past the growth of the, the owner. Yeah, man. The, the f- it's funny, your Richard Branson story. I have a, a good friend and mentor of mine that he had a similar experience out in Necker. And he said, first thing he did when he came back to his assistant, he said, from now on, you're doing all my emails. I'm not doing any more emails. And you think of, and now I'm embarrassed that I still do my own inbox. Because the, because thinking like that, I've heard this a few times now. I've heard it several times and it wasn't from, it wasn't from small producers, right? It's from guys that are crushing the game. It's, it's you, it's Richard, it's, it's David. It's Gary V. It's literally, there's no person at, at scale that can work any other way because of the demand on their time. It's just a pure nature of, of growth, right? If you've got a company that's, you know, million plus and like you're dealing with all this demand, you're, you're going to be the router, right? And this is why having that's, there's a, this in the book, I, I create this framework called the replacement ladder because people are always like, okay, well, what's the order that I need to replace things at? 
right? So yeah. let's say you have an exec. So, so the first level is literally admin. Okay. And, and it's, it's inboxing calendar is kind of the two core outcomes that you have to delegate outcomes, not tasks. Then the next level is, um, delivery, right? Fulfillment, whatever you sell in your business, hire somebody to help you with fulfillment so that if, you know, you can pass the 10 X test, like most people, if their business grew by a zero at the end of the, like 10 X the next month, they, their lives would be chaotic. Right. But if you have somebody that can help you with fulfillment and you might be there at the beginning conversations, but then can pass it off to somebody, you know, like that's, that's a, and I think a lot of really, you know, high income earning real estate professionals, that's a hundred percent where they go first. Right. And they get that team in place. Then they can move into marketing, like replacing somebody to help on all the marketing strategies. Right. So that, you know, cause like what I've discovered, a lot of entrepreneurs, I had this one entrepreneur, Rachel, she, her business was always ebbing and flowing. It's like when she would do the marketing, she'd get a bunch of leads and then she'd be busy and she'd make money. And then while she was making money, she wasn't doing the marketing and then it would just yeah. flow back down. And she was always like, I'm in this rat race. And I'm like, look, you make money, go build some. And this is trafficking campaigns. That's the marketing level, right? Then the level mm -hmm. above that is sales, like getting yourself out of the selling process, which sounds crazy. I remember the first guy I hired Michael to be one of my salespeople for my coaching. It was just me. And I was doing most of the calls, but it got to a point where it's like, I wanted to serve more people, but I'm, I can't give up my calendar. Like it just didn't make sense financially. So I hired Michael. And, and again, I used the camcorder method. I just gave him a bunch of recordings of my calls. Didn't have anything other than that. And I said, listen to these calls and see what you can do. But like I had already solved the marketing problem. So sales was next. And within a day, he had got somebody to invest like some serious money without talking to me. And that was like, this is after building software companies and having big sales teams. There was just something I was blocked on personally that I just couldn't let go of the idea of somebody hiring me as a coach, but not talking to me. But look, I didn't need to have that whole discovery conversation and where they're at and their goals and all that stuff. I just needed somebody else to understand the process to make sure there was a good fit. Once they became a customer, that's actually the part I love to do, right? So I could do those things. And, and like, I remember Michael, I was like, dude, how did you, what did you say to this person? He's like, I actually think it's easier for me to sell you than you to sell you because you're now demonstrating to the buyer that you do the things you teach. And I was like, Oh snap. How many business coaches don't have businesses? Right? Like I find it fascinating. Right. So, so that's sales and the top level is leadership. And this is, this is next level. A lot of people aren't there, but like when you get to the level of, of flow, that feeling of flow, it's because every core function of your business has somebody waking up and doing one of their focus on two things, their focus on strategy and their focus on outcomes for that department, right? And the day that you actually, and what's cool if you do the first, like after executive admin and you do delivery, uh, marketing and sales, you, you're kind of there. You can go on those vacations for three weeks and your business will grow because the people are in place. Now at scale, you need somebody to run those departments and that's the, the top level, the replacement ladder. But it's just a clean framework, I think, for people to understand like, where am I at in this? Did I skip a level? Is it hard? Maybe I should come back down, rebuild that, build some processes and playbooks to kind of move forward. But that's that's my prescription. Man, this was, uh, I think a lot for a lot of listeners are drinking, from, drinking from a fire hose right now. So the, when does the, when does the book come out? January 17th. So it, it is, it should be out soon. And, um, I'm really excited because for me, like I've, I've been thinking of writing a book and, you know, I've produced over 350 growth playbooks inside of SAS Academy. And I've put out, I think 500 videos on my YouTube. So I've put out a ton of different things but this is the foundation of it all, right? You can't do the other stuff I teach to grow and scale a company without being in a position to actually like have the space to execute and to, to, to do the stuff. So I'm really excited because this, I think it's a completely different framework on kind of where it sits. And I had um, this w one guy, Taki Moore, who's a good friend of mine and coach. He, he said it sits between the E-Myth and the four-hour work week, right? And I really like that because I want to teach people not only to like value their time, buy back their time. And it's very tactical, the book with tons of stories, like the whole thing I've peppered stories. But it's also like a call to build an empire, right? Like I don't want people to buy back their time and do nothing. I, I literally want them And the last chapter talks about like the personal stuff in the house manager. I want people to realize like, oh, I can build a great company and, and, and also have an incredible quality of life. I mean, Aaron, we're friends on Instagram. You see the post, like the reason I, sh I just put my life out there is I want people to know like, 
I work really hard, but I also play really hard. And I, and I have a great relationship with my two boys and my wife and we travel the world, but I'm also building companies and investing and doing all the stuff that, you know, I was, I was worried because I was like, well, I'm driven and I don't want to sacrifice the family stuff. But truth is, is that if you look at it through this lens of your buyback rate, a lot of people could have got there a lot sooner and, and lived a, you know, Richard Branson's a billionaire the billionaires want to be like. So I think yeah. he's a good guy to model. Yeah. The billionaire, the billionaires want to be like the, um, and, and, and I mean, Instagram and social media, I, I love it. And I think it's fascinating. And I think it's fascinating because of, because of the relationships that people get to have, because we get to follow along with people's lives, because we can have interviews and also know that we're picking up on something. Um, I mean, there was, there was one thing, I mean, you posted on Instagram one day of, uh, you were working on an airplane. Right. And you were like, Hey, an, an Olympic athlete would be working right now. And so the, and I fly a lot, right. I fly lots and lots of hours. And I remember messaging you just going like that. You've ruined every one of my, you know, watch a movie on an airplane. Yeah. I, I think I said, yeah. Like entertainment over education or something like that. Right. And, Cause the reality yeah. is you're it's, like, it's oh, like, dude, I never have enough time to just work unfocused and like write out the stuff I want to. But then on planes, I'm like, what movie am I going to download? And watch. So lots of fun stuff out there. So January 17th, the book's called Buy Back Your Time. So I'm sure people can probably pre-order now if they're they're listening this early. But yeah, it's gonna be out. It's gonna be a full force. I've I've poured my soul into this for the last two and a half years. And I'm really excited for people to to get it. I was shocked you didn't have a book already. When you said it was like your first book, I was thinking, like, really? I wanted to because I have seen so many of your playbooks. And your videos and everything else. So the and unless you were a software I'm, person, you couldn't buy anything from me. That's what's crazy. I just I just gave and gave and gave, and then it's just like I didn't want to write a book unless I had a unique perspective or something to write about. And this was the thing that I just couldn't not kind of put out there. I just felt like it was it was unique and a different approach to to looking at our time and to to kind of building companies. Yeah. So in the meantime, people will get your book, but if they want to, if they want to reach out to you early to follow you on Instagram, is that the best place to keep up with what you're doing and see? It, it, I'm all, I'm on all the platforms, but Instagram is the behind the scenes. Like yeah, on the story side, that's me. I'm posting, but I'm on YouTube. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, even TikTok. I have a half million followers there, but yeah, I'm uh, Instagram is probably the best and buybackyourtime.com is the website for the book. So if you do buy it, buy it through the site or at least click through the sites. Cause I got a bunch of extra bonuses for people. Yeah. Yeah. For anybody out there, it's, I mean, it's so easy to like buy something on Amazon and buy something on, on audible, but it is for anybody that has their own sites. It means so much more to authors as as we push through there. I mean, I think uh, we, we have several different books and I think on uh, one of the ways when we were releasing through Amazon with, with, on one of them, they're like, well, we're going to let you keep 10% of the revenue on this one. But if you want to sell it on your own too, we're only going to let you keep 5% of it. It's ridiculous. So anyway, get the extras, go through the full way for it. Dan, this was a lot of fun, man. It was fun getting to catch up. And the and so thanks a lot for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. All right, real estate rock stars. Thanks for listening. All right, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Muchastegui jumping in again to thank you for listening to the show. Hopefully you guys loved listening to that one. And I want to make sure that you know about all of the extra resources that we have. And also we need your help. They say podcasts are free. You get to listen to podcasts for free. But what is the cost of that podcast? I would say if I could beg you to pay anything for that podcast, I would say the cost of the podcast is going and giving a review. So whether you download it on Google or Apple or YouTube or anywhere else, please go give us a review. Say what you liked, what you didn't like. It helps us get better guests. The more reviews, the higher we get in the rate rankings. Right now, we are the biggest podcast out there for real estate agents. And we want to keep that spot because we know there's lots of podcasts out there. So go give us a review. Also, be sure to go to hybendigital.com. If you liked any of the resources that those real estate agents talked about, we've got a huge video vault of those resources for free. Every penny that comes on the podcast that we interview, they give us something that helps them get their deals or helps them work with their clients. And we put that in the toolbox in our vault for you. So go to hybendigital.com and you can get it. If you're looking for real estate education, go to rebusuniversity.com. We have all sorts of courses in there to help agents succeed in real estate, how to get the listing, how to negotiate deals, you know, how to become an investor, all sorts of different stuff, rebusuniversity.com. 
And if you want to chat with me, go find me on Instagram. And if you come find me on Instagram, you can send me messages. Tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. We try to put a bunch of content out there too. You can find me in two different places. It's at rerockstars.com for our Real Estate Rockstars page or at erinamuchastegui.com for my personal Instagram page where I can chat with you about all sorts of different things. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon.